good evening my dear students myself dr prasad paul in the department of surgery is here to deliver a lecture on abdominal trauma as we all know you come across abdominal trauma in the emergency department due to various causes you are likely to get an abdominal trauma as part of road traffic accidents assaults sporting activities work site injuries fall from heights etc so how you classify this abdominal trauma so when a patient with a history of an abdominal trauma or a road traffic accident or a fall from height or a sporting activity or whatever is brought to the emergency department like any other patient we go in for the vitals to see whether the patient is hemodynamically normal hemodynamically stable or hemodynamically unstable so that is how you classify abdominal trauma or it could be a blunt trauma or it could be a penetrating trauma this is how it is classified hemodynamically stable unstable or normal blunt injury or a penetrating injury blunt injury can be fall from height blow by a fist crush injury seat belt injuries rta assaults etc whereas a penetrating injury can be by a sharp cutting weapon or a gunshot injury or as a part of instrumentation like the different scopies ogd scopy colonoscopy or sigmoscopy or even during any instrumentation or any guided procedures there is always a chance of injury so how do you approach a patient with a history of likely history of abdominal trauma what is the mechanism of injury like i mentioned earlier is it due to an rta is it a fall from a height is it due to an assault is it due to a sporting activity if it is a fall from height from what height did the patient fall down was the mechanism of trauma violent in nature was it a blunt trauma or was it a penetrating trauma and of course the time interval between the occurrence of this traumatic event and getting into the hospital if there is any delay whether the patient has vomited out any bloody contents which is suspicious of an intra-abdominal organ injury there is pass urine again if there is discoloration of the urine or hematuria likelihood of a urinary bladder injury prior drug history the level of consciousness of the patient history of alcohol intake these things are taken into account coming to the physical examination you see whether the patient is moving in the bed or patient is lying down quiet which is which may be a sign of peritonitis or the patient is restless dehydrated or having increased thirst which is always suggested of hypovolemia due to hemorrhage so there might be tachycardia tachypnea subnormal temperature baby fall grease and pallor 
So if the patient has got peritonitis, the patient will have a Hippocratic facies with a bright sunken eyes, pinched face, dry fissured tongue, blue lips. Coming to the local examination, you inspect the skin of the abdomen, especially if the patient is unconscious. You see for any bruise, lacerations, any perforated wound, or any pattern of bruising. For example, likely due to a seat belt injury or a rope. It's called the London sign. In a conscious patient, you ask the patient to point to that particular area where the patient has got pain. And you can relate it to the underlying anatomical structure. Whether the respiratory movements are present or not, for example, the patient with a lower rib fractures, the respiratory movement will be decreased. Even if the uh, upper rib fractures also respiratory movement will be decreased, but we are we are looking into the abdomen whether the patient has got any decreased respiratory movements, which is suggestive of either a lower rib fracture or peritonitis. Looking for the contour of the abdomen, is there any generalized distinction? Maybe due to hemorrhage or peritonitis, or a localized distinction due to adhesions. Umbilicus sometimes might be pulsed because of hemorrhage or peritonitis. Here you see a patient with a blunt trauma abdomen having some discolorations in and around the umbilicus, and you see some impressions, probably a tire mark. Huh? So on palpation, if there is any tenderness, especially localized, it can give you a clue regarding the injured organ. For example, the right hypochondrium, you have the liver, left hypochondrium, you have the spleen, like that. Is the peritonitis localized or generalized? Rebound tenderness because of the irritation of the peritoneal peritoneum can be present. And muscle guarding, involuntary because of the irritation of the peritoneal peritoneum and rigidity may be voluntary because of the intra-abdominal injury. Is there any particular swelling, maybe due to a hematoma of the liver or spleen? If there is an increase in the intra-abdominal fluid level, you may get a fluid thrill on excitation. Whether there is an increasing abdominal growth is it associated with any lower rib fractures, especially in the right side of your the liver injury associated with that, and in the left side you have a clinic injury. And always you see for any palpable crepitus. On percussion, you see whether there is any obliteration of the liver dullness, which is suggestive of a gas and retractor, probably due to perforation of the hollow viscous. Is there any shifting dullness? Again, suggestive of fluid inside the dump. Suprapubic dullness because of the urinary bladder distension. You have to auscultate for the bowel sounds, whether they are present or not. And sometimes in severe violent trauma, because of the rupture of the diaphragm, the bowel loops may get into the thorax producing bowel sounds inside the chest and you always auscultate the chest for any pneumohemothorax. Systemic examination is done, spine and pelvis you do the compression test laterally and inward compression to see for any pain which is suspicious of any fractures. The rectal and pelvic examination, pervagin examination will tell you whether there is any fluid in the rectal uterine or rectal vaginal pouch. Is there any discontinuity of the mucosa? You examine the urethral meatus, the external urethral meatus to see for any blood, especially in suspected cases of pelvic fractures. And make sure a repeated examination is the rule because 
some symptoms and signs may not be present in the initial examination and which can later turn out to be positive. So repeated examination is the crux. Sorry. So how will you investigate the patient with a blunt trauma of the abdomen? Initial investigation comprises of a complete hemogram, especially you look for any drop in the hemoglobin in back cell volume. We always make sure the most important thing is a blood grouping and cross matching because if at all required, this should be done immediately. A coagulation profile, electrolytes, the renal function, the blood sugar, the arterial blood gas analysis urine routine and serum amylase these all come as a part of a routine examination in a patient with a blunt trauma. Stable patients can be shifted for imaging investigations either an ultrasound or a CT of the abdomen. X-ray chest is done to exclude the thoracic injury and abdominal viscous may go into the thorax when there is a rupture of the diaphragm, especially associated with the fracture of the ribs. So X-ray abdomen erect will tell you if there is any gas in the diaphragm. Is there any loss of the psoas muscle shadow because of bleeding, especially in the retroperitoneum. Contrast radiography like an IEP or an angiography for kidney or renal injuries endoscopy for gastro duodenum for the stomach and the duodenum a cystoscopy for a urinary bladder laparoscopy and diagnostic peritoneal lavage so these are the uh, number of investigations when you come across a blunt trauma abdomen but all of these are not required in all patients so your investigation is always selective depending on the nature of the trauma and the organs which are likely to be damaged as part of this trauma depending on the history and clinical examination. So that is how you proceed with these investigations and make sure only stable patients are taken up for investigation. The first and foremost is a resuscitation. And only if the patient is stable, you shift them for investigation. Suppose the patient is hemodynamically unstable. What is your plan? You resuscitate the patient, meanwhile, you can go for what is called as the diagnostic peritoneal lavage. What you do is you make a small sub umbilical incision with around one liter of normal saline is introduced into the peritoneal cavity and we're moving the patient from side to side. Then you aspirate the fluid. You see whether there is a gross bloody tap. Examine those aspirates. See whether there are more than one like RBCs, more than 500 WBCs, you have to be careful. And the serum amylase is more than 175 national units. These all are suggestive of a positive diagnostic peritoneal lavage. This is applicable to blunt trauma abdomen. Whereas in penetrating trauma, one tenth of these values is deemed positive. So there is about diagnostic peritoneal lavage. But nowadays we have something called the FAST or focused abdominal sonogram for trauma. There is nothing but an ultrasound which is done in the emergency department. As the name indicates, it is focused. It is rapid 
it is non invasive to determine the presence of free intrabrown fluids and this can to some extent supplant a dpl in the evaluation of unstable patients after a blunt trauma so blood more than 100 ml in the cavities can be identified but this is not very reliable for bowel or penetrating injuries so it mainly focuses on the right upper abdomen the morrison space the perisplenic and the left perirenal areas the perivesical there is a suprapubic region and the pericardium the subcephalic region so whether there is any fluid in these regions so as i mentioned earlier any trauma the initial management is a b c d e airway management breathing circulation visibility and exposure suppose you get to see a foreign body which is being penetrated into the abdomen it should not be pulled out because that will help you to identify the track or the trajectory of that weapon extruded intra abdominal contents especially as a part of entering trauma should not be placed back we cover it with a clean cloth and adopt measures to arrest bleeding we give 100% oxygen because the patient might be in hypovolemia so oxygen is required badly so most of the patients may go into hypovolemia dehydration loss of blood hemorrhage so 100% oxygen is supplemented white bore iv line is kept a nasogastric tube is done to decompress the gi tract to catheterize the patients to monitor the urine output blood samples are sent iv fluids are given either crystalloid or colloid depending on the blood pressure the trauma cd x-rays are done especially the chest x-ray cervical spine pelvis and in an injection tt and a tet globe depending on the injury now coming to the specific management specific management may be conservative or an exploratory laparotomy depending on the injury conservative treatment is adopted for hemodynamically stable patients a negative abdominal examination that means no particular abdominal findings absence of extravasation on contrast ct which means there is no leak or there is no extravasation of blood absence of other indications splenic injury in children because of the self hemostatic property of the capsule you can opt for a conservative management if the patient is stable and one thing to remember is conservative management is to be done only in a hospital setting especially in an intensive care unit you have to carefully monitor the vitals serial examination of the hematocrit imaging and some trans- transfusion to maintain the hemodynamic stability so that is about conservative management when will you go for exploratory laparotomy if the patient is a hemodynamically unstable if the patient is having a positive dpl in an unstable patient or after imaging investigation you see there is frank hemoperitoneum penetrating injury evidence of severe bleeding you may go for a laparotomy for example a grade 4 5 splenic and liver injuries we will come to organ specific management in detail later sometimes you may have to go for a splenography a partial splenectomy an arterial ligation or even a total splenectomy stomach you may have to go for a suturing if there is a penetrating injury a door now you may need a nominal patch 
So, organ specific management. So, when you go into individual organs, you see liver. The so right side of liver injury is more common than the left side injuries. You may have a subscapular injury, you may have a transcapsular, you may have a central intraparacranial injuries, and depending on that, liver injuries are graded into different types. A grade 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like that. So you may have a patient experiencing pain, bruising, tenderness, rigidity, and the right heart contrary. Because of the blood, you may get shifting dullness and absent bowel sounds because of the hemoperitoneum. And because of the irritation of the diaphragm, you may have a right shoulder tip pain and as may be associated with the fracture of the rib bulge. Sophie, ah, yeah, ah, 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 I don't know I don't know if you can learn the learning. I So, you can repair the liver, what is called as a hepatography, ligation of the biliary tract bleeding vessel, the portal tract ligation or the pendulous menu. You may sometimes need a hepatotomy or hepatic artery ligation for a central or a slight rupture. So these are just techniques in which when a liver is injured, the most important thing you have to remember is the springle plug and pack that is how it is written in Bayesian law now spleen what are the immediate signs of rupture of spleen and depending on the grade of splenic injury you may have generalized signs of shock hemorrhagic shock some specific signs include bruising of the left upper abdomen, tenderness and guarding of the left upper abdomen, distension with paralytic ileus, pain referring to the left shoulder tip, it's called the curse sign, which is due to the irritation of the left diaphragm. Because of the hemoperitoneum, you may experience a shifting dullness and persistent dullness on the left side of the abdomen because of the AD coagulation of the sternic blood which is called the balance sign and you do a 
Prorectal examination, you see tenderness and swelling in the retrovesical pouch. There is nothing but the collected blood. An area of tenderness, the triangular area between above the clavicle between the sternocleidomastoid and the sclenius medius on the left side is called the sagacious splenic point. Tenderness elicited in the triangular area above the left clavicle between the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the sclenius medius. You may get pigmentation around the umbilicus because of the coagulated blood tracking through the falciform ligaments. It's called the Cullen sign. A delayed type. There may be a symptom for a period of 10 to 15 days to the sign to appear. So there you see a splenic injury, a stab wound, you can see the stab region. So most isolated splenic injuries, especially in children, they can be managed conservatively. Adults, especially in the presence of other injury, the physiological instability, laparotomy should be considered. And every possible step is taken to preserve the spleen. And spleen can be packed, repaired, or placed in a mesh pack. But if perioperatively the patient seems unstable, it is a safer option to go for a splenectomy. And uh, if there are multiple potential sites of bleeding, so. When there is a shattered spleen, it is better to go for a spinal check. There is great for injury. In certain situations, even a selective embolization, anti-embolization can play a role to some extent. When you go for a spinectomy, you have to inoculate the patient against pneumococcus like especially the Capsulate organisms, pneumococcus, that's influenza like that. It is advisable to get this inoculation done within two to three weeks, by which time the patient's immune system has recovered. Now coming to stomach. It is mostly injured by a penetrating trauma. The presence of blood is diagnostic if found in the nasogastric tube or in the absence of bleeding from other sources. So most of the time penetrating injuries need exploration and surgical repair is required. And great care must be taken to examine the stomach fully because an injury to the front of the stomach can be expected to have an exit wound elsewhere on the organ, maybe at the same anterior wall or maybe through and through anterior posterior. So, can treating injury of the stomach leads to perforation, peritonitis, the mucosal terror can be a full thickness, leads to necrosis and hematemesis, aerophagia and a gastric illness. Duodenal injury, you come across those injuries frequently adjoining with the pancreas. So like the pancreas, the duodenum is retroperitoneal and so often the injuries are hidden and usually they are discovered late or during a laparotomy is performed. So CT is usually the diagnostic modality of choice. The only sign might be a gas or a fluid collection in the periduodal tissue or a leakage of an oral contrast, administration of which may improve the accuracy of the diagnosis.
the stomach on the other hand if there is a perforation you are most likely to get a pneumoperitoneum and the treatment is always a surgical repair by suture so what about duodenum smaller injuries can be repaired primarily especially the first third and the fourth parts of the duodenum they behave like small bowel and can be repaired in the same manner but what about the second part it has got a common blood supply with the pancreas especially it is fixed to the head of the pancreas and hence may have a poorer blood supply compared to the remainder parts so a major trauma especially if the head of the pancreas is seriously injured should be treated as part of damage control procedure and referred for definitive care and we will move on to the damage control procedure later during this lecture isolated traumatic biliary injuries they are rare they usually occur as part of other adjoining organ injuries and most often they occur from a penetrating trauma the common bile duct injuries on exploration you can get it repaired over a tea tube or drained and so that it prevents biliary peritonitis and it can be referred to appropriate care as part of damage control or even ligatures pancreatic injury usually occur from a blunt trauma again it is a retroperitoneal organ so there is always a diagnostic dilemma and ct remains the gold standard for accurate diagnosis the elevation of amylase or lipase might be insensitive and penetrating injury may sometimes be only detected at the time of laparotomy so classical teaching is the pancreas should be treated with conservative approach and a close suction drainage so conservative surgery is done so injuries to the pancreatic body to the left of the superior mesenteric vessels and to the tail are treated by close suction drainage alone with the distal pancreatectomy if the duct is involved so conservative surgical approach is done as far as pancreas is concerned but as proximal injuries to the right of SMA are treated as conservatively as possible sometimes we may need a partial pancreatectomy in order to minimize the pancreatic enzyme stimulation by the gastric juice or distension you know the pancreatic enzymes are autolytic so to prevent the gastric juice from stimulating the pancreas you need a pyloric exclusion procedure in some situations the pylorus can be temporarily closed in association with a gastric drainage procedure like a gg a gastrogenostomy sorry <coughs> a vipuls procedure that is a pancreatic duodenectomy is rarely indicated rarely needed a damage control procedure with packing and drainage should be performed and the patient be referred for definitive surgery once the patient is stabilized coming to small bowel injuries most often it can be a rupture following a blunt trauma or a penetrating injury producing perforation and peritonitis and the pointing test is being implemented localized tenderness and rebound tenderness here you see there is a transection of the bowel near total transection so the individual loops that is on exploration the individual loops may be trapped causing high pressure rupture of a loop or tearing of the mesentery the frequently injured as a result of blunt trauma but penetrating injury can also produce small bowel injuries and small bowel injuries 
they need urgent repair because there's the bile spillage leading to pleuripertonitis. Hemorrhage control takes priority and the wounds are completely closed, controlled with simple sutures. Mesenteric injuries can be closed or open injuries, most often as a result of deceleration injuries resulting in tearing in the areas which are freely mobile. The bowel attached to the retroperitoneum with a hematoma decreases the blood supply and resulting in necrosis. So there might be persistent tantanus and rigidity or deterioration even after good resuscitation and sometimes the large tears may lead to bowel necrosis, peritonitis and sepsis. So if there is a mesenteric vessel damage, there might be an impending bubble ischemia that will dictate the extent of resection. And resection should be carefully planned to limit the loss of viable small bubble but should be weighed against an excessive number of repairs or anastomosis. So resection should be very carefully planned to limit the number of anastomosis at the same time to limit the loss of viable small bubble. So hematoma in the small bubble mesenteric borders they need to be explored and to be ruled out for perforation. With low energy wounds the primary repair can be performed whereas more destructive wounds associated with violent trauma they require anastomosis. As part of damage control to prevent the bleeding to arrest the bleeding, to control the bleeding, to control the contamination, you need to employ something called the clip and drop. You just close the bowel, you just arrest the hemorrhage and drop it. And once the patient is stable, you can have a second look that is called clip and drop. That is a part of damage control. Regarding colon, you may have an ascending colon, descending colon intra or extra retinal ruptures. You may have a transverse colon or a sigmoid colon which can rupture intraperitoneal. So intraperitoneally if the colon ruptures there is always a high possibility of a severe peritonitis especially fecal peritonitis and this turns out to be fatal. Extraperitoneal it may produce a spreading cellulitis or a surgical emphysema. So you may sometimes need a sigmoidoscopy or a barium study. So injuries to the colon from blunt injury are relatively infrequent. More often they are of penetrating ones. So if there is a little contamination, the viability is satisfactory, the wounds can be repaired primarily. Or else you may have to go for a damage control approach like a clip and drop as mentioned earlier. A defunctioning colostomy can be performed later or the bowel re once the patient is stable. Rectum, it can in get injured either intraperitoneal or extraperitoneal. When you do a PR, you see for any evidence of blood or is there any palpable irregularity in the mucus. Only 5% of the colon injuries involve the rectum, generally from penetrating injuries, especially associated with fracture of the pelvis. Again, digital examination to see for blood. And when you get a pelvic fracture, a rectal injury, you always think in terms of an associated bladder or a proximal urethral injury. So with intraperitoneal injuries, the rectum is managed as far as colonic injuries are concerned. A full thickness extraperitoneal rectal injury, they are managed with either a diverting end colostomy and closure of the distal end, sometimes called the Hartman's operation or maybe a loop colostomy.
depending on the severity of injuries, the renal injuries can be classified as slight, severe or critical. The slight includes the parenchymal damage without rupture of the capsule, extension of laceration into the renal pelvis without any hematuria, only mild tenderness, etc. Whereas the severe injury, the pelvic, the calyx is injured with the hematuria, uh, loin hematoma, leakage of the urine, etc. A critical means the kidney is shattered and the pedicle, the renal artery is torn. And delayed rupture may lead to a clot dislodgement. That is maybe the reason for delayed rupture of kidneys. Ureter and urinary bladder. Again, penetrating injury is the common cause leading to hematuria. And urinary bladder, most often, it is rupture extra peritoneally associated with fracture of the pelvis. So, when you want to assess the pelvis, so if you detect uh, pelvic fracture by means of this compression or distraction test, you should always be suspicious of an underlying bladder injury. There might be extravasation of urine to the perivocycle space, you can elicit tenderness of the lower abdomen an increase in the pulse rate and despite intense desire the patient will not be able to pass urine because of the injury to the bladder and the urethra and because of the extra peritoneal drainage of urine there may not be any bladder distension. When there is an intraperitoneal rupture of the bladder, there will be signs of peritonitis with abdominal distension, rigidity and pain. Again, the patient has no desire to pass urine or fails to pass urine. With tenderness of the hypogastria, shifting dullness and absence of propylic dullness because the urine is leaking into the peritoneal cavity and pulse when you do a product examination you see there is a bulge retrovesical pouch this is because of the collection of the urine urethral rupture is diagnosed by the triad this is the bulbar urethral rupture is diagnosed by triad of retention of urine, perineal hematoma and bleeding from the external urethral meatus, most often associated with pelvic fracture. Whereas membranous urethra, when there is an intraperitoneal rupture, the prostate, the apex of the prostate is injured, it might be floating and patient will not be able to pass urine. And usually the prostate is not palpable. And this displacement of prostate upwards is called the Vermouth and sign and there might be a bruising and dullness above the umbilicus. So in stable patient, CT scan is the investigation of choice with contrast. And for assessment of bladder injury, a CT histogram might be performed. So, uh, one precaution to be taken when you do a cystogram is the bladder should be adequately distended so that the extra position can be made out because if there is a small leak, small injury, the small leak cannot be detected because of the contraction of the bladder muscle. So, two views are usually taken on two occasions, an AP and a lateral and sometimes oblique and a full 
and a post micturition so extra peritoneal rupture is usually associated with fracture of the pelvis and usually will heal with an adequate drainage via transurethral route suprapubic drainage is reserved only when it is not possible unless the patient is unstable conservative management is preferred the kidneys can be angioembolized if required uretric injuries are mostly rare and generally due to epitreating trauma most ureters can be repaired or diverted if necessary and can even be ligated as part of damage control procedures bladder on intraperitoneal rupture of the bladder usually is from a direct or a blunt injury and this requires the surgical repair extraperitoneal rupture is usually associated with fracture of the pelvis we already mentioned and just requires a transurethral drainage of urine now coming to the retroperitoneum retroperitoneum is always producing a diagnostic dilemma because some of the tests that you routinely do like the epidural sound the diagnostic peritoneal lavage all these can be negative so the investigation of choice is always a ct scan but this requires a physiologically stable patient So when you quantify the retroperitoneal injuries for intraoperative assessment and management the retroperitoneum is broadly divided into three zones of which the zone 1 is the central zone where you need an exploration always and always there is a central hematomas once proximal and distal vascular control has been obtained the lateral zone or the zone 2 hematomas are explored only if they are expanding or pulsatile because they are usually renal in origin and can be managed non operatively but sometimes they may require angioembolization pelvic or zone 3 injuries as with zone 2 these are only explored if they are expanding or pulsatile why because the pelvic hematomas they are exceptionally difficult to control once they are opened so the best method to control them is compression or extraperitoneal packing and if the bleeding is arterial in origin it is better to angioembolize now penetrating traumas when you get in with a penetrating trauma it is better you explore for damage to the structures along the wound track for example you reach unless pre operative investigation allows a non surgical management of the injury Now coming to the concept of damage control because any patient sustaining a trauma usually can land up in the deadly triad if things go awry like hypothermia acidosis and coagulopathies these are the patients that can slip into high risk category because this forms a vicious cycle hypothermia acidosis and coagulopathy so what is this concept of damage control actually this originated from the naval shipping strategy naval ship building strategy whereby the ships were designed so that the damage was kept local and which allowed only the minimal repairs needed to prevent it from sinking while definitive repairs waited until it had reached the port so the designing of the ship itself to limit the damage to a particular region as it mean local and which allowed only minimal repairs and sail the ship to the shore and then definitive repairs are planned this is the concept of damage control and this prevents the ship from sinking here the ship is our patient and 
the definitive repair is taking place in the port the port is nothing but a field of expertise so damage control means there is damage control resuscitation as well as the damage control surgery so damage control situation will help to prevent the patient going into the vicious deadly triad of acidosis hypothermia and cagliopathies so the minimum amount of surgery needed to stabilize the patient's condition may be the safest course until the physiological derangement is corrected that is the concept behind damage control surgery so once the physiology has been corrected the patient is warmed cryoglobulin is corrected and patient is returned to the operating theater for any definitive surgery so there comes hypothermia is corrected that is patient is warmed acidosis is corrected the physiology is retained the ph is coming back to normal or near normal and cryoglobulin is corrected then the patient is taken for definitive surgery so damage control resuscitation is particularly done in the emergency department the time in the emergency department is minimized and majority of the resuscitation is carried out in the operating room normally when you get a patient in the, in the emergency department or the casualty the resuscitation is taking place in the emergency department but here as part of the damage control situation the resuscitation itself is taking place in the operating room so in order to prevent the time delay both the damage control resuscitation and the damage control surgery is taking place simultaneously in the operating room not in the resuscitation bay that is the damage control resuscitation so checkpoints are hemoglobin acidosis and clotting so therefore they are directed towards early delivery of biological active clots clotting products and whole blood in order to buy time so these are the checkpoints you keep in mind hemoglobin acidosis and clotting so the physiological disturbances that are associated with the downward spiral including acidosis cryoglobulin and hypothermia this is the vicious triad and the attempts are made to avoid them rather than react to them so acidosis hypothermia and cryoglobulin are prevented to a maximum extent so what are the goals of damage control surgery stopping any active surgical bleeding and controlling the contamination so once these goals are achieved the operation is suspended and the abdomen is temporarily closed and the patient is taken back to the intensive care unit where further resuscitation is taking place and other therapeutic indications also now what are the stages of damage control surgery stage 1 is a patient selection stage 2 is a control of hemorrhage and control of contamination stage 3 is resuscitation continued in the intensive care unit stage 4 is a definitive surgery and stage 5 is the abdominal closure so it's step by step patient selection control of hemorrhage and contamination resuscitation in icu definitive surgery and closure of the abdomen these are the stages of damage control surgery now what are the indications for damage control surgery anatomical in the reasonability to achieve hemostasis for example the pelvic bleeding inability to achieve hemostasis complex abdominal injuries for example liver and pancreas combined vascular solid and hollow organ injury example aortic or cable injuries associated with the hollow organ injuries so a complex injury 
inaccessible major venous injuries, retrohepatic vena cava, demand for non-operative control of other injuries, for example, fractured pelvis, and you anticipate that it is a time-consuming procedure. So these are some of the indications for damage control surgery. Anatomical indications. Now physiological. That means there is a decline of the physiological reserve. The patient is going into hypothermia. The patient is slipping into acidosis. A lactate level of more than 5 millimoles per liter. An increased prothrombin time. An increased APTG. More than 10 units of blood is transfused to the requirement of massive blood transfusion. A systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm of mercury for more than one hour. So these are some of the physiological uh, reserves which can decline and which can initiate a damage control. Environmental problems like the operating room temperature, there is a temperature loss of 2 degrees centigrade per hour if the operating time is more than 1 hour. Inability to approximate the abdominal incision because if you close the abdomen too tight uh, that will lead to what is called as a compartmental syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome which in turn will lead to decreased venous return, decreased preload, bowel ischemia and all such complications and the patient is going for acidosis. And if you are having a desire to reassess the infra abdominal contents for the second look, then that is also the arena of damage control operation. What is abdominal compartment control? When there is a raised infra abdominal pressure, the patient will have far reaching consequences and produce a lot of morbidity and mortality in a critically ill patient and hence early recognition is very very essential. Now, how do they affect specific organs? Is the abdominal compartment syndrome, the intra-abdominal pressure rises, so there will be an increase in the renal vascular resistance leading to a reduction in the GFR and impaired renal function. Take the cardiovascular system. Because of increased pressure, increased pressure over the veins, there is a decreased venous return, resulting in a decreased preload and a decreased cardiac output. Respiratory, you have increased ventilation pressures. Why? Because the diaphragm is printed because of the increased pressure. So you have decreased lung compliance and increased airway pressures. The visceral perfusion itself is decreased that will lead to bowel ischemia and there might be severe rise in intracranial pressures also. So we talked about uh, some of the injuries, vascular injuries which can be managed by angioemphysis which is a hallmark of interventional radiology in abdominal trauma. So useful in the management of torso trauma as both an investigative as well as a therapeutic tool for patients with vascular injury. So angioembolization following demonstration of ongoing bleeding in splenic and renal injury is a valuable technique. Now there is no level one evidence to recommend the use of antibiotics for the insertion of chest strains. Prophylactic antibiotics are probably required in all cases of penetrating abdominal trauma. So unless there is a major contamination, a single dose is more than enough. So what is the take home message as far as this abdominal trauma is concerned? The most important is whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable or not. What is the mechanism of injury? Is it a blunt or a penetrating injury? 
is there any delay in presentation and always any treatment start with a b c d e of resuscitation stable patients blunt trauma ideally you resort to conservative management whereas spin treating injuries ideally should be explored only stable patients are taken for imaging if the patients are unstable diagnostic peritoneal lavage can be tried but nowadays we have we focused abdominal sonogram in trauma which is supplanting this tpl the investigation of choice in blunt trauma or penetrating injury is a ccd of the abdomen so one thing you should be careful is penetrating injuries to the viscera on exploration might have an entry and an exit wound so solid organs which are stable are conservatively managed hollow viscous injuries need exploration they were of the deadly triad of hypothermia acidosis and coagulopathy and there is always a role for damage control resuscitation and damage control surgery 